quick update on my friend. I shared a story with you last week that she, ran, she was running in Tokyo, and she completed her sixth major marathon. As a, she fulfilled her commitment. Her second fastest marathon ever at like a 11 minute and 31 second clip. It's like, that's as fast as I run my, on a good day, my, my half marathon. But she very much wanted me to thank you all for, for praying her up and partnering with her as uh, she went out and she ran and, and completed her commitment. Uh, today, I, I'm excited about, um, I'm glad to hear that we had these couple uh, announcements about ministry partnerships because we're talking about partnerships. So I want you to think about this with me, with me for a moment. If you were to start a business, what would be the qualities? What would be some of your top uh, characteristics that you would look for to enter into and be partners with someone? What would need to exist? What would be on the top of your list to partner with someone in, in business together? Now, as you're thinking about that, right, we have... Uh, a great history of lots of great partnerships. Uh, and so I, I put together some of the things that I thought about that came up, and to most of your surprise, there's no sports up there, but um, there's no sports partnerships. But on the top left is the, this relationship that formed between brothers. And, and they went into partnership, and they became first in flight, the Wright brothers, in 1903. How many have been to the, uh, the Wright museum down in uh, North Carolina. I've been there a couple times. Yeah, some of us. It's, it's just cool to walk there where the first in flight, and I don't know, I wouldn't have gotten a plane for like that. Not at all. But that was their partnership. And then the, the, the middle top one is a little bit older, so until I say it, you may not quite recognize the guy on the right is Elton John in the music industry. Now you see it, right? It's Elton John. He's a great singer, right? Amazing voice, very talented, but without his songwriter... Bernie Topin, the guy on the left, they don't have this great partnership. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they, they, but, but with it, they formed a great partnership because you got your singer and you got your songwriter coming together. And then on the, the far right, I don't know which one's which, maybe you could tell me it's okay, but one is Steve Jobs and one is Steve Wozniak. And what did they partnership, partner together with? Apple, right? You know, back in, I think it's 76. Where is it? Da, 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 da. Yeah, back in 76, the, they partnered together, both uh, Jobs' marketing and, and, and business acumen, along with the, the build and design of Wozniak. They came together to, to, to give us this, this, uh, this Apple. And many of you are holding a, uh, an Apple iPhone or you've got iPads at home, and, uh, but they formed this great partnership as they, as they brought together these, these qualities and characteristics that made them... Uh, what we, what we know of today, made Apple what it is today. But then you got the movie industry back in 96, I believe it was. Yeah, 99, sorry. 99 to about 2006, Pixar partnered with Walt Disney to create some of, some of the, uh, the most fun and animated films, uh, like Cars and um, what's, the, what's the one with Woody? It's, um, thank you, Toy Story. It's been too long for me. Toy Story and The Incredibles and all that. So they partnered together, but they, brought, they both brought something unique. And when they, they, they formed a relationship and they built this partnership and, and together they, they just, they had great qualities and great characteristics. They just complemented one another. Then, of course, you know the one in the middle, right? Ben and Jerry's. And, I mean, that's some of the best ice cream out there. I know Fox Meadows gives it a run, don't they? I don't know who started that, but Ben and Jerry's. And then... Just for fun, my last one, you can't go wrong partnering chocolate and peanut butter together. The only thing that's better is, you know, you know what it is? It's putting Reese's peanut butter cups in your ice cream. Now that's what we're talking about. That's good partnership, right? You know, in each of these relationships, what helped them form great partnerships is a set of characteristics that together made each one better. Right? We can recognize that. We can spend some time on that. We can decipher that. But I don't know what would be on the top of your list. But as I thought about this, what's on the top of my list, and this is just my three. They don't have to be your three, but they're just my three. One is, is uh, shared interest. I'd want to go into business with someone who, who is passionate about the same things that I'm passionate about. So that's the first one, is, is shared interest. The second one would be trust. Can I trust you? Are you capable? Are you competent? 
And are you reliable? Are you going to do the things that you said you're going to do? And you're going to want to have trust in me the same way. It's not just a, a one direction, a one-way street. It's a two-way street, right? So it's shared interest, it's mutual trust, but then there's shared values. Are we after the same things? Are we looking to accomplish the same things in the same way? Do we have the values and the goals that I'd want to be in business with someone who shared all of these qualities, all these individual characteristics, they would be at the top of my list. Now, you may have a different set that's at the top of your list, but those are the three for me that need to exist for me to enter into a partnership with someone. I asked a friend about this, and many of you know David Ober, and he's the director of operations, of organizational operations with his company, with his, his family business. And here's what he has to say. He says, when we go into business as a business with a client, we look at how their values align with ours. Their purpose is to serve others and build partnerships. He says, before we enter into these partnerships and into these types of relationships, we ask lots of questions. Now, he gave me like a page and a half, and I can't give you everything that he gave me, but you might want to talk with him if you know him. Stop him and talk with him. He's, he's very strategic and very he, he just amazing uh, in his ability and his, his uh, uh, yeah, in his ability to, to just bring together partnerships within his organization and lead that organization operationally. But he says, here's some of the questions that they ask. He says, will we be able to serve them and follow through on what we committed to do? And he says, where's the level of trust? Is there a pathway to, to, to partnering with these folks where we're going to be able to trust one another, where it's mutual? You know, there's all kinds of partnerships that exist, and what makes a great partnership is when the right set of characteristics exist in the relationship. I was talking with one couple here last week and again this week. They've been married for 50 years. And they said to me, there was another couple, I think 55. I got them mixed up, but 50, 55 is about the same, right, at that point. But both of them were saying how communication, what needs to exist in, in, in marriage is open and honest communication. That's what needs to exist in that kind of partnership. In business, what needs to exist uh, for the, the, the characteristics is the commitment to the corporate vision. Where, where the client, the customer, where their customer experience, it, 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 there's this vision where you're, where you're focused on the, the corporate vision where that customer experience is met and it's kept and it's pursued continually. But then I thought about this in terms of ministry. What must exist? What must be on the top of our list? Uh, to partner is we need to have clarity about our vision. Because when we have clarity, we know our identity. We know who we are, what we do, why we do it, and who we do it for. This morning, as we finish our series with this last part of our internally strong and externally focused vision, we're going to look at partnership and what we're committed to at Hope. It's partnering with others. So let's take a look at this, and let's, bring, uh, let's, let's, let's see um, what helps us form a great partnership and, and how, what we pursue as a church, as believers, as a body, as a family of believers. Here's what it says. We, when we partner with others, we are committed to partnership, which means we're believing that the regional church will have a greater impact if and when the local churches and Christian organizations aren't doing everything on their own. They're working together to meet the physical and spiritual needs of others. So our external focus will include partnering with others. So the characteristics that need to exist, we're going to look at today from a text in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So you can, you can open your Bibles there. It'll be up on the side screens in a few moments. But I want to tell you first why this is so important. Every partnership that exists... Every single partnership that exists accomplishes more when we're working together. When we have the same passion, the same vision, and we, have, we work together, there's collaboration. And as a church, this part of our vision is that we're meeting the physical and spiritual needs of others. 
and hope there's no greater partnership. There's not a single greater partnership than when we're committed to partnership in relationship with God, listening to the Word of God, being led by the Spirit of God, and moving, who's moving in the, in the people of God so that we're working together for the glory of God. There's no greater partnership than this. So as we get to this map that's up there and you're questioning, what's going on up here? Before we get to our, our, the, the, the crux of the text that we're going to dissect, we need to look at the context. And so what I've done is I've, I've asked uh, us to s- kind of post this, this picture. And this is Paul's third missionary journey. He's, he went on three. You can read all about them uh, from Acts chapter 13 to Acts chapter 21. And as, as I've read through these again, the first and the second and the third journeys, you see that Paul's partnering with different people. On his first journey, he's, he's partnering with Barnabas. And then he goes out on his second journey, and he's partnering with, um, with Silas. And then here on the third, among other people, he's partnering with Titus. So he leaves from Antioch, and he, and he travels through Asia, and he goes up into uh, Troas, up in uh, north west asia there you go you can see the thanks that's great and then you, he travels over to Neo, uh, neapolis my eyes are bad even with the glasses and then he goes down to the churches in macedonia i'd really encourage you this week just to go back and and get the history get the geography because it, there's just so much more of a, a a better clarity to to what we're talking about today when you understand that kind of history that kind of geography And I'm not a history buff, I'm not a geography buff, but this was really helpful for me. I think it'll be helpful for you. Read those chapters through the week. It'll really give you some insight about Paul's, uh, the the patterns of Paul's, uh, of what Paul's facing. But for our context today, let's jump in at uh, Acts, not Acts, chapter 2, there we go. 2 Corinthians, who has it got? Someone's tracking, thank you, appreciate your help. See, it takes takes partnership, right? Um, we're going to look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm going to go through the first 15 verses before we get to our text. We're really going to dissect. But here we go. So Paul's missionary journey, he, he writes 2 Corinthians from Macedonia is when he writes it. Um, it's a year after he wrote 1 Corinthians, and about the year 55 AD, and he's asking the Corinthian church to partner with him in something. So let's read what that's about. They're facing opposition. This is the story. And now, brothers, verse 1, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich, rich generosity. So the Macedonians are experiencing some, some hardship, some difficulty, some financial uh, poverty is what they're facing. But they're contributing generously to the ministry. And what we see is in verse 3, for I testify, Paul's writing this to the Corinthians about them. He's saying, I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even much more than they were able and, uh, and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. Entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. Now, if you're with us for the first time or you're relatively new, there will not be a special offering at the end. <laughs> okay? I don't, we're not after your wallets. We're looking, we're looking at your heart. Okay, that's what Paul's doing here. He's saying they gave according to what was in their heart. But they didn't expect what Paul expected. They didn't do what Paul expected them to do. Verse 5, he says, they didn't do what we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. They're pleading and they're urging, right? Can we help? Can we, can we contribute? Can we, can we be part of this ministry? They're begging Paul to let them be part of it. So they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. They had been people who had received spiritual benefits. Now they wanted to be used by God as instruments of his grace. They had been been recipients of the benefits of God's grace. Now they want to use every opportunity to bless others. And in this way, they were doing it materially because of the famine that they were facing back in the, uh, the, the church in Jerusalem. There was a famine. There was opposition they were facing. It's people, And that's the pattern you'll read. If you read through Acts, you'll see they went out, they preached the gospel, some believed, some didn't, and they faced opposition every step of the way. 
That's what's happening in Jerusalem right now. And they're partnering with him. So he says, verse 6, So we urged Titus, here he is, his ministry partner, since he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, and he goes through it, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see to it that you also excel in this grace of giving. So he is talking about giving here. He's saying, I want you to excel in everything, including what you had already committed to do. He says, I'm not, and here's the key. He says, I'm not commanding you to do this. This is not a command. He's advising him. He's saying, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. He's saying, hey, Corinthians, for you know not only the gift that the Macedonians are giving, and that expression, that example of giving and sharing the grace of God with others, he's, now he goes to the ultimate example. He goes to Christ. He says, For you knew, or you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, might, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here's my advice, again, not a command, but advice to you about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. So now finish the work. Finish what you said you were going to do. Bring it to completion so that your, your, your eager willingness to do may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not, in, not according to what he does not have. So here's our desire. It's not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. Right now, here's what's happening. He says, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. These Macedonian churches, what you have, you can give and you can contribute to these other church, this other church over in Judea. So that in turn, their, their plenty will supply what you need when you're in need. That's how this equality he's talking about works. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. So with this as our foundation, as we consider this situation, let's look more closely, beginning in verse 16, with the rest of the story, the characteristics that must exist that are on Paul's list as he's talking to the Corinthians about this, this opportunity to give and partner with him in ministry. The first characteristic we must have as, with our ministry partners is with those who have alignment with us in our concern for others. Notice how they have the same concern in taking up this collection for those who are in Jerusalem. He says, I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern that I have for you. Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm, and he's doing this in, on his own in, and with his own enthusiasm, uh, on his own initiative. And then there's this unidentified brother in verse 18. He says, and we are sending along with him the brother who is praised. That word praised, it means he's known for. He's famous for this. He's praised by all the churches. He's famous for his service to the gospel. He has this affinity, this alignment with us in our concern for others, just as Titus does, this unidentified brother does, in his service, in their service for the gospel. So what's more is he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry out this offering, which we administer in order to what? Honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness, our willingness to help. You know, at Hope, we have lots and lots of ministry partners. And there's a long list, and it, they're, they're up on the side screen here. They're regional, they're locally, they're regionally, they're globally. And depending on, yeah, we might be missing one or two there, so I apologize if we are, but these are our ministry partners and as we partner with others, we have an external focus team. And what they do is they walk through an application process. They walk through an interview process. They walk through a selection process. And they, they, they do this prayerfully with the discernment of God. 
And each year, throughout the year, uh, sometimes quarterly, sometimes uh, twice, you know, two times annually, we get email reports. We share them with you in our newsletter. We share them with you as often as possible. But the members of this external focus team, they stay in contact throughout the year so we can make sure that we have this ministry characteristic, this alignment as their concern for others remains. When a ministry partner's in the area, we try to get them up here so they can share with you what's going on and you can meet them and see them face to face. But we have, uh, I think it's 25 to, probably 30 to 35, somewhere in that range right there that's listed. Now, just as we see Titus in verse 16 and 17 and the unidentified brother in 18 and 19, we're thankful to God for these ministry partners because we can do so much more with them. Without them, we're limited. With them, there's this unlimited opportunity and ability. And as I look at Titus and I, I look at this unidentified brother, I, I think about our ministry partners. Titus, he had a wonderful reputation for the gospel, in his concern for others, in his willingness and his eagerness on his, his own initiative. But same with this unidentified brother. He's praised, he's known for, he's famous for sharing the hope of the gospel and the truth of the gospel, the good news of Christ. And he's chosen by all the churches. He's honored, he's honoring the Lord and he's living for his glory. He has this willingness to help and partner with others. Now, this is so important because together we re our reach is better. It just is. As we share with others the grace of God, it's why we're so committed to partnership. We have a greater impact when we partner with others in ministry. So we want to make the most of every opportunity and try to meet the physical and spiritual needs of others. And that's what happens when hearts that are changed by God are hearts that are used by God. 2 Corinthians 8 is a great example of partnering in ministry with others who have the same passion, the same commitment, the same pursuit in their care and their love and their commitment to truth to reach others and help others continue to do the same. Hope Community Church is rich by all accounts spiritually and materially. So let's keep on doing what we've been doing and partnering with these ministry partners and, and showing God's love generously with this kind of encouragement, not under compulsion, but with conviction that we will put our faith into action and participate and partner in relationship where God has called us to partner in relationship with others. You know, 2 Corinthians 9 is one of those passages I mentioned earlier about giving. And it really isn't about the wallet. It's about the heart. Where is our heart? Paul writes this. He tells us how we can be used by God since we've been changed by God. He says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Hope, I don't want to know what you give. I just want to encourage you to do it. I personally don't need to, I don't need to know what you give. But I want to know that, that, this, this, that your heart's been changed by God and that, you're, using, that God's, you're being used by God to change the lives of others for God and his glory. Verse 7 says, each man should give what? What he's decided in his heart. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, someone who has open hands and a willingness to step in and step up and, and serve. And there's so many different ways to do it. It's not just financially. The argument, not the argument, uh, the interactions I've ha I had when I was studying about like, how much did the Macedonian church give? We don't have a dollar amount, but they did indicate that it doesn't seem like it was a great deal. But it was so much. It was such a sacrifice. They gave what they could give. It's like the widow who gave two mites, which is, by one account, it's like one-eighth of a cent but she was commended because she gave all she could. Not beyond what she had, but she gave sacrificially. Hope, where's our hearts with this? Has your heart been changed by God? I mean, truly, what we sang about earlier, has your heart been changed by God that you've entered into a relationship with him? 
If it has, someone has poured into that ministry, either financially, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, but in some way, faithfully, that you're able to be in a right relationship with him. That your heart may be right with him. Now, is your heart, if your heart's right with him, are you being used by him? You know, I remember years ago walking into a, uh, an apartment with a, uh, another uh, pastor friend of mine, and, and it was this guy who unfortunately was a hoarder, and he had all this stuff. Sometimes we hoard what we have, and we don't just use it. God wants us to use what he's given us. We've received God's grace. Let's use God's grace and extend it to others. Don't keep it to ourselves. Do we have hearts changed by God and are they being used by God with the same concern for others we see with Titus and this unidentified brother? So we've got the first characteristic that we must have with ministry partners is that alignment with people who are concerned about the welfare, the the well-being of others. But the second characteristic we must have in ministry partnership is with those who have a commitment to personal integrity. Guys, this is missed so easily so consistently, but Paul says, no, I'm not going to miss this. He's just very clear. He's just very clear. He says, we want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. When we take this contribution, we don't want there to be any question how we handle it. For we are taking great pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in in the eyes of men. And he says, in addition, we're sending with them our brother, you know, the, the one who's famous for the gospel, who has this, this uh, alignment with us in ministry, he also has great personal integrity. He's proved to us in many ways that he's zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. See, Paul took great personal and individual care to make sure that this ministry was not disqualified, that they weren't DQ'd, they weren't, they weren't discredited, I had to do the math, but over 30 years ago, I was working in this, in this one insurance industry. I worked for two different insurance companies, uh, seven at each time, e- each one. But the first insurance company I worked for, we had two kinds of policies. One was a fiduciary responsibility policy, and the other was an employee dishonesty policy. Both of them have to do with uh, responsibility to manage properly the assets, the resources that you have in your care. As a fiduciary, that's what it is. You have to navigate, you have to operate in such a way that you are handling what you've, what you've been entrusted with in the care of others for the benefit of others. That was the fiduciary, the FRP, the fiduciary responsibility policy was all about. And then the other was the employee dishonesty policy. And it's, it is pretty much what it says. It's covering employee dishonesty. If people steal from you because they're not living with personal or financial integrity. Now, I'm thinking about this because my job was to, as an underwriter was to, to underwrite the risk about mismanagement, mishandling financially, the finances of a company, maybe the securities, the property, or the money. Now, there were two occupations. We call them occupancies, basically two types of businesses that we categorized them that were the worst at this, that had the, the highest risk. One was contractors mostly because they didn't have a double a counter signature checks. One person would write the check, and so they could easily just take a few cents here, a few dollars here, and get away with stuff. You see that at the local level sometimes in uh, political you know, areas and townships and things like that. But the second occupancy, the second business or organization, anybody want to take a guess of what that was? Where are we? Yeah, it was churches. And the reason is because they weren't taking seriously this this responsibility of personal integrity. Now, he's not here today, but uh, I play golf with one of our guys who's our uh, two guys that take care of our finances as far as making sure they take the collection. I play golf with him. He's honest on the golf course. I'm pretty sure we can trust him. Another one's Caleb, and Caleb, has, I don't have any question about his integrity. But we have, we have systems in place to be careful that we are sure that we have a commitment to our integrity because we don't want the ministry to be disqualified. Our text tells us how Paul took great care for this. You see, ministry isn't only about our ability and our generosity. 
what we do. It's about who we are. Do we have personal integrity? Do we have corporate integrity? See, too many fall because they fail at taking this seriously. What Paul's saying is, when we partner with others in ministry, we need to take great care to avoid criticism and do everything we can to handle our ministry responsibly, to live with personal integrity. In God's eyes, and in each other's eyes. So he says, we're sending those who are praised and they're chosen and they're proven. They have the ability and they have the integrity. So how do we do this? How do we make sure that we partner in ministry with others who have these characteristics? We seek God. We seek God for clarity. As I said, we do the interview process, uh, the application, the interview process. We, we maintain connection in conversation, but there's lots of prayer and lots of wisdom that comes from God in how we navigate this. We want to ha- keep our attention focused on alignment in ministry and our commitment to integrity, never losing sight of our ministry partner's ability and never letting that ability to outweigh in any way their personal integrity. You can ask Alice. I really don't want to know what people give. I try to stay out of it as best as possible because we want to live above reproach without any we want to avoid criticism so we're going to live with transparency it's why the EFT the external focus team reviews each ministry partner annually now I get I get uh, emails by a company uh, an organization called ministry watch and sadly they send me way too many uh, emails about how uh, about how many people fail at this miserably They fail morally and they fail financially, repeatedly. And usually what's lacking is accountability. As a church, we decided a few years ago to partner, and you may not know this, with Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. There's too many things for me to list there, but those are the seven standards that we go through an audit every year. We subscribe to each of those seven standards, and we have their seal of approval. We're, We're in compliance with what they live uh, what, what they exist to do. What's on top of their list are those seven standards for us to partner with them. If you go to our website, you go to the first page and scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see that little ECFA. That's Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. And you'll, you can learn more about that. But we take this integrity, this idea of, of, of personal and, and corporate integrity seriously. So that's why we partner with them in ministry. You know, we can have all the ability in the world, but when we lack integrity, it hurts something. It hurts our story. It hurts our testimony. And that's our third characteristic that needs to exist. It must exist to partner in ministry with others. That's our testimony. Uh, you know, it's, what's, it's what matters most. Not only do we have to have... Uh, do, uh, do, not only do we... I'm, I'm trying to hurry, sorry. Not only what we do, it matters with not only what we do with our ability and our integrity but it matters because of who we represent. That's our testimony. We partner. We must have ministry partners who represent Christ and honor him. As for Titus, he's our, he's, uh, uh, Paul writes, he says, he's my partner and, and fellow worker among you. Verse 23 says it. He says, he's my friend. He's giving his recommendation. Recently, I was asked to give a recommendation for someone. If I get a phone call, she's getting a a stellar uh, recommendation because she's exceptional on so many levels. I'm not going to embarrass her and name her, but she's here. Uh, But that's what Paul's doing here. He's giving Titus this recommendation to the Corinthians because of his his testimony. They know each other personally. They're participating in the work. And that's, that second word there, that second phrase of fellow worker, it's the word we use for synergy. Together, they're better. It's this, uh, uh, this combined effect, and it's greater than if you added the two things together on their own. It's where one plus one, someone said, is greater than two. There's just a greater dynamic there. It's a greater result. And they're representatives of the church, and they're honoring Christ They're sent on a mission with a message. That's what it means to be a representative. They're honoring Christ and they're living for the glory of God. And verse 24, Paul says, 
He's saying, show these men the proof of your love, Corinthians. Don't just talk about it. Follow through. Follow through on what you say you're going to do. See, ministry isn't just about building our little, own little kingdoms, but it's about building God. And, and that involves us giving what we've got. Sometimes it's financially. Sometimes it's, it's, it's uh, relationally. It's, it's emotional support. It's that, that help that others need. So let's make the most of every opportunity like the Macedonians are doing and give sacrificially. However, wherever and whenever God is calling you to, but don't turn a deaf ear to him. Follow through on what you, what, uh, you commit to. Let your testimony be your story. Put your faith in action, as James 2.18 says. Hope, we have a wonderful testimony here. We have people with incredible stories. We have people that open their homes in their neighborhoods for Bible study with people who aren't believers so that they can hear the truth about God's love and sacrifice for them to repent and believe. We have a ministry I'll talk about in a few moments, a little more detailed, but our Hope, Hope Helps ministry. It's intended to be out in the community, but it's been partly here at the, at the church and helping families that are, that are maybe experiencing uh, just difficulty from uh, somebody who's uh, widowed, uh, you know, a widower or someone who's um, uh, maybe elderly or just someone who needs a little bit of, of help. But so many, I think 29, I think there's like 29 different ministry uh, volunteers who are willing to serve when we get this, this, this email or this, it's actually a text that comes. You can join that team. And if you're able to help, step in and help. We have people with incredible ability who partner with us willingly. There's someone who gave our youth ministry about a year and a half, and to the point of I don't know the, the numbers, I don't know the numbers, I forget, thirty, forty thousand dollars over the, the course of two gifts, so that our youth ministry could just go and, 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 and be, be um, energized and, and, and equipped and encouraged to do what God is, to be who God called them to be and do what God's called them to do. We have so many people with integrity who partner with us financially, you know, giving to the fries and the, and the freezins and the, the vangs back in, in, uh, for our Christmas gift to them financially and materially to under-resourced communities like Arm of Hope and Echoes up in E-Town. And then spiritually to families and students through uh, ministries like Awana and Disciple Makers up at E-Town College. So I want to close with this message and our series on our vision with the same challenge Paul ends with. Hope keeps showing the proof of your love. Keep doing what you've committed to do. As one of your pastors, I want to thank you for partnering in ministry with us in being internally strong and externally focused. We can't do this without you, but we're doing what we're doing, and God is moving because he's moving in and through you, not just the staff, but in and through you. And I love partnering with you. I love partnering with Kirk. <laughs> I could talk for a long time about lo the love I have in partnering with Kirk in ministry on so many levels, deeply aligned with him in, our, in being internally strong, in our vision of being internally strong and externally focused. Deeply aligned with him in his integrity. I mean, he's a man of great integrity. And his story, his testimony is fantastic. Same with our elders. I love, min I love partnering with our elders. What a great team we have. Even all the office quips that we have every once in a while, we joke around. We have a great chemistry, but man, we are focused on what God has, to do, has asked us to do. Our staff, I love working with our staff. I love working with you and partnering with you. No, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I love being with you guys. I love partnering with you in ministry. It's such a blessing. So I want to invite the uh, worship team to come on up. I love part, being in partnership with you all because we're, uh, worship team, if you guys can come up. Okay. Um, I just want to close by saying this. Since we're, in, since we're recipients of God's grace, will you continue to be re, uh, instruments of God's grace? We have four opportunities. There's so many more, but I mentioned the Hope Helps Ministry. Really, it's, it's an opportunity to help people that maybe need some help. 
maybe a, a recent widower or someone who is uh, elderly or does not have skill sets in certain areas. That's both internally, we help with people at Hope, but also friends of Hope who go out. But then we also have the Ghana Missions Fundraiser we already mentioned, we mentioned number four, the Arm of Hope 5K. You can participate, you can help with that. But then there's that third one I wanna focus on just for a moment, that Kentucky Crisis Response Mission Team is leaving on April 7, coming back on the 12th. There's a team of eight, they're working with our Evangelical Free Church of America Association, the, the, what's called our REACH Global Crisis Response Team, and they're helping the flood victims in Hazard, Kentucky. So everything that's given to help them, they're asking for, uh, will help to rebuild homes, provide encouragement and support. We're asking for prayers and for financial support. Can you give one or the other? Can you give both? If you can, fantastic, please do. But be praying for our team. It's uh, the Bushes, the Wells, the Shaws, and the Andersons. They'll be leaving um, in the next month or so. And pray for the response team and for the families there that are devastated by the floods. The team is looking to raise $4,000. There's a way to do that. Uh, check out our, our, our newsletter, reach out to the office, and we'll find a way of doing that. And then there's a survey that you can participate in. We'd ask that you uh, look at that and you answer those questions. You can do that later. But right now, if you would, just pray with me. Father God, we thank you that we are in partnership with you because we're in relationship with you. Father, if anybody's here who's not in a relationship with you, I pray that you would just... If they're just wondering, am I? What does that even mean to be in relationship with the living God? I'm not sure I'm there yet. Maybe you might be here saying that or considering that. But Father, I just ask that your spirit would move in them to, to talk with me or to talk with someone else who's here. Father, we want, first and foremost, that's, our, that's what we're in partnership to do, is to introduce people to Jesus so they would submit their lives to you. To Jesus, the one who sacrificed his life to save our lives. Lord, we ask that you would continue to, to work among us here at Hope, and I'm so thankful for all the ministry partnerships we have, and for every single person here who is continuing to partner with us. We are blessed that you are not after our wallets, you're after our hearts. You're after our lives that are submitted and committed to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and thanking you. Amen and amen. Would you stand? Let's make this song our response.
Specifically, I'm going to encourage you to invite others. We're going to start a four-week series as we enter into the Easter season. Who is Jesus? What a great opportunity to invite people to hear the truth about who he is. Not what people think about, not what people just consider may be true about, but specifically, what does God say about who he is and why his life matters for everyone? I'm going to encourage you to come back uh, next week. I'm not going to command you, but I am going to encourage you. Get outside today. The weather's fantastic. So have a great week. We'll see you next week, hopefully.